So please uh, just keep that in mind. We will be uploading uh, today's webinar to the TYR uh, YouTube channel once we are finished. So if uh, you have to leave early or you want anybody else on your team to see it, please feel free to share that link uh, that I'll be sending out once the webinar is concluded. We'll also be sending out a brief survey for an evaluation, so please feel free to give us your feedback. It's always very helpful and very welcome. Throughout the conversation today, as you have noticed in the previous webinars, if you've had a chance to join us, there is a chat box feature within the GoToMeeting setting. So if you would like to go ahead and open up your chat boxes and say hello, please feel free to do that. Chat with each other during the conversation. Um, also, feel free to post questions throughout the call today. So today's webinar, um, entitled, uh, the, Is There a Difference? Collegiate Recovery at Public versus Private Institutions, is a concept actually that I um, started talking to a, a colleague of ours at Penn State, Jason Whitney, about a year or so ago, I think now. Um, we were curious as to uh, what the outcomes have been with some of our grantees uh, that are located within a private institution. And Jason, of course, uh, is one of our grantees, but he's also been doing collegiate recovery for a while now. And we had some concerns, you know, just anecdotally, we started to see that there were some uh, pressures and some stressors that were emerging from the private school community that weren't necessarily, we weren't really seeing in the public institutions. So I took a quick look uh, back at the TYR history within this uh, particular subset and found that about a third of the grantees that were from private colleges are not are no longer in existence since 2013. So um, I reached out to Brown and uh, to Loyola, who have collegiate recovery programs and uh, were also uh, very willing to, to share some of their experience with us. Uh, but I really want to encourage everybody on the call to feel free to be a part of this conversation. Um, I think that uh, HBCUs, uh, some of the community colleges, um, rural universities, a lot of these uh, various subsets of uh, institutions that are offering collegiate recovery services um, are, are an, a really interesting place for us to take a closer look at these populations. So um, please feel free to ask the questions in the chat box. And then again, we will have some conversations at the end of the, the discussion today. So I'll go ahead and introduce uh, our speakers that we have today. I'm very excited um, to do this. As you all know, when we talk about the history of collegiate recovery, we always start off with Brown University. Um, Brown is the, the first known university to have any kind of recovery support that was actually out of the closet on campus. So um, to have Shannon O'Neill join us is, uh, and to present today is, is a huge honor for us. Um, and as Dean for Recovery and Substance-Free Student Initiatives, Dean O'Neill provides leadership for students, faculty, and staff with respect to issues of chemical dependency. In addition to providing direct support to students as they progress towards degree completion, she collaborates with other offices to develop campus policies regarding alcohol and other drugs. Dean O'Neill received her PhD and MA in Social Personal Personality Psychology from the University of Albany, State University of New York, and her BA in Psychology and Women's Studies from the College of St. Catharines in St. Paul, Minnesota. She has um, an immense amount of experience, especially with diversity and women's issues, um, and particularly with substance use disorder treatment and then setting up recovery support services. So she's going to be first up. I'm also going to go ahead and introduce Zachary Hitchens from Loyola. Uh, I wanted to kind of mix it up with having, you know, the oldest uh, collegiate recovery program in the country mixed in with one of the newest. And Zach has certainly um, created uh, one of uh, the most passionate and dynamic programs that, that I've had the opportunity of getting to know recently over the past couple of months. So i um, really excited to have him join us as well as a lead. And Zach serves as the Assistant Director of Student Support and Wellness Promotion at Loyola University in Maryland. Zach has a master's of science in college counseling, a post-master's certificate in the advanced study of psychology, and is a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor in Maryland, and a national certified counselor. Before coming to Loyola in 2012, Zach worked as a mental health counselor at Lewis University, York College, uh, and Shippensburg University. At Loyola, Zach is the sole provider of alcohol and drug counseling, and as well as oversees the campus prevention education programs. Notice the word sole provider. I'm sure some of you can identify with that. In, in 2014, Loyola University, Maryland received a seed grant 
from TYR to start the Cardner Collegiate Recovery Program, which at the time was the only CRP in Maryland and the Patriot League Athletic Conference. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenters today. Uh, we're going to have Shannon up first, and, um, and then again, we will have about 15 minutes at the end to go over some of your questions and comments. So Shannon, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, Kristen. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, so Brown, as you mentioned, was the first uh, college or university to establish uh, recovery services for students. You can go ahead and move on to the next slide. Yeah. Um, so we're primarily a residential campus, uh, 6,500 undergrads. Um, it's very diverse. We have students from all 50 states and 115 countries. Um, it is a, a pretty competitive environment. We have about a 7% acceptance rate. Um, the nice thing is, though, that once you get here, we work really hard to keep you here, which I think, particularly for our, our students in recovery, we, uh, we do try and do everything we can to get them through to graduation, as we do for all our students. Um, primarily urban campus, and it's a highly engaged student body, so we have a lot of student activism around a number of different topics, and I think the prior uh, five years or so, the students have done some really great activism around destigmatizing mental illness that I think has really benefited um, some of the initiatives that, uh, that we've tried to do with our collegiate recovery program in combining with substance-free students. Uh, so it was first established in 1977 by Bruce Donovan, who was a Brown alum as well as professor of classics. Um, I am housed in the dean of the college office on the academic side of the house, which I do think is also a little bit unique in the collegiate recovery community. Um, his initial focus was on faculty, but quickly expanded to students. Um, in 2003, when he stepped down from his role, it became an endowed position. So families um, and alumni who he had helped, helped to endow, uh, endow this role. So. Um, half of my position is covered by, by that endowment, and the other half is other sort of academic duquesnal duties that I have. Um, and I'm the third person to, to hold this, this role. So the, the major component and the, the most longstanding component of our program has been our weekly early sobriety at Brown Group. Uh, so it's a weekly meeting. It is facilitated um, by a local clinician. Uh, we don't really have a, a, a specialized AOD clinician on campus, which is interesting, has been interesting for me. Um, so I, I secured uh, somebody off campus who comes and facilitates that, who's been active uh, and had been a referral that my uh, predecessor had given me. Uh, it is limited to students who are committed to abstinence from all non-prescribed uh, substances. Um, when I started about two and a half years ago, that was three people. and not always the same three. <laughs> so I'm happy uh, to report that now we have a pretty strong group of 10 students. Um, and one of the things that we've also done over the years here at Brown is we have also invited students from uh, RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, which is right next door to us. Their students can also participate in that group, which also helps to add peer support and numbers. So we do have, uh, we just had two students from RISD join our group as well. So I provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, academic and personal advising. Uh, we can do course load reductions for students who are just entering into the recovery process. Um, I also uh, serve on the Committee for Academic Standing, so I can also advocate for students in that way if they find themselves in academic trouble as a result of early, uh, early recovery or, or relapse or anything like that. Um, we do do referrals to, you know, we have about six, um, 12-step meetings that meet on campus, um, including young people's, a women's, and a LGBTQ uh, meeting. Um, I don't, I don't get disciplinary referrals. I know, I don't know. I think if we're talking about how recruitment happens, which I think might be a big difference in how public and private operate, but um, I'm, I'm not. I'm really looking uh, for students to enter a program who are, who are ready for change. Um, and, and willing to commit to, to the abstinence. Um, so that's usually self-referral, counseling, health services, um, et cetera. Um, we don't uh, really recruit from off campus. Uh, we don't uh, reach out to local treatment facilities to sort of 
recruit students to come to Brown for the recovery community. We're really working with, with whoever is here. Um, and that being the case, I think uh, one of the ways in which we try to address those, how do you make your program sustainable? How do you show numbers? Which I think, I mean, luckily my position is endowed and we'll be here regardless of how many students we have at our early sobriety at Brown group. Um, but I think um, growing my role to include students who are substance free, which really happened when I, you know, my, my title used to be the Dean of Chemical Dependency and it, it had been for um, decades, which um, I had changed once I arrived since it is an antiquated, um, antiquated term. Um, a lot of students who are substance free for a wide variety of reasons, either family history of addiction, health reasons, or religion wanted to, help, to tell me about their experience being substance free on our campus and the, the struggles they had with that. So I've really worked to advocate for um, all students who are substance free. And um, we did start a standalone residence for 17 students who are substance free. And that does combine students in recovery with students who are substance free for other reasons. And this is our first year of a very active So Bear, because we're the Brown Bears. That's S-O capital E-E-A-R uh, student activities group, which has a substance free activity every weekend, which I think is different than sort of university sponsored non alcohol alternative events, which I think is supposed to reduce harm high risk drinking. Um, it's specifically for students who are identified as substance free or who want to be substance free that that for that event or that weekend. Um, and our big uh, spring weekend is coming up this coming weekend, which is a, you know, really a lot of um, you know, concerts, music, um, drinking, and, and substance use. So this year we're trying uh, something new and I'm taking 65 students off campus to a local camp for a, a weekend getaway, which I just, you know, about 24 hours ago started to wonder why I was doing that. <laughs> but we'll see how it goes. Um, so I think, is that my last slide? Do I have one more? Right. Yeah. So I think I think because, you know, we get very few transfer students and we do not have a lot of uh, students who would be maybe considered adult resuming undergraduate education or who transferred for, from someplace else. Uh, and we don't do part time study. So I think when we're talking about a difference between private and public, I think some of these parameters make it challenging um, for students to or for students to, to enter the private college or university system. So I think, um, you know, I've been talking with local colleagues at other institutions in Rhode Island, and we've had a chance to meet and talk about our approach to our collegiate recovery communities. And I think, you know, some schools are integrating more harm reduction. Or, and I often have wondered, what do you do with a single substance abstinent person, right, who just is stopping the Adderall or just is stopping the opioids or, or the pot? Um, and, we're still sort of trying to figure that out. But I do think that the combining of our students in recovery with the students who are substance free so far has worked well for us. And I think part of that is that we do have a kind of a you do you culture here at Brown and um, a lot of activism around mental health and destigmatizing all language. And we do know from our most recent statistics that 19.5% did not drink at all in the past semester. Um, and I think that then the substance using peers really respond well when we have framed this in a previously silent and invisible minority gaining voice um, and, and really been able to talk about the adverse impacts that substance use has had on their living experience and then their access to education here at Brown. Um, and I think the substance using peers have really responded well to that rather than an enforcement message, which does not work well here at all. Um, so I think I think that those were the points that I that I wanted to make. So that's great, Shannon. Thank you so much. I um, we had a quick question from Sarah about the meetings that are offered on campus. Do you could you yep. just kind of go over that one more time? Are they smart meetings or a variety of different types oh, of sure. meetings? Yeah, so we have the early sobriety at Brown group, and that is, um, you know, that's once a week. Uh, usually at lunchtime, uh, we provide food, and that's been eight to 10 students now this year pretty consistently. 
six 12-step meetings on campus. Four of them are AA, two of them are NA. Um, there is a smart recovery meeting that is about a mile and a half a way that students have Ubered to. I don't have any students who have been using that as a primary support. We also have a refuge recovery meeting that is not far from campus, but I, we haven't found any, any interest in that. So I think I would say about half of our students use 12-step um, recovery programs, and the other half are really using the early sobriety at Brown Group, individual therapy, and um, their own sort of recovery plan right now. Thank you. That's great. Um, and thank you again for the information, Shannon. We're, I have a list of questions that I want to ask you during our discussion time. We're going to go ahead and go over to Zach now, though, and check in with what's going on at Loyola. So, Zach, take it away. Okay. Hopefully everyone can hear me um, and this is working. Um, so, hi, I'm Zach Hitchens, like Kristen said. Um, I'm here at Loyola University, Maryland, where I'm the assistant director in student support and wellness promotion. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, just to give some context about Loyola, we are a Catholic Jesuit university. Um, a big part of being a Catholic Jesuit university is this idea of cure personnel, which is care for the whole person. So the fact that we have a collegiate recovery program is very much rooted in the value of caring for the whole student. Uh, university was founded in 1852, and we are in Baltimore City. Um, we're in a very park-like area of Baltimore, but we are an urban campus. And we have 5,700 students, predominantly undergraduate, uh, our graduate students. We do have a graduate campus um, about 10 or so miles north of campus. So some of our grad students have class there and some have it on the main campus as well. And a majority of our students come from out of state. So only about 18% of our students are Maryland residents. So we attract students from all over the country, all over the world. Um, we also have students from other countries who are studying abroad here in the United States at Loyola. So that's, I know it happens at other institutions, but that also um, creates a unique feel to our campus. And we're highly residential. Um, part of the draw to come to Loyola is our housing is normally ranked in the top 20 in the country. Uh, so after students' first years at, or first year at Loyola, they're in very, very nice apartments. They're in townhouses. Um, it was a bit disheartening for me when I started here that my students were in nicer housing than the apartment I had. Um, but that's a big part of life at Will is that we have a phenomenal residential experience. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so our collegiate recovery program, it looks like it's pronounced Cardoner, but it's actually pronounced Cardinaire. Um, it's a river in Spain. Uh, being that we're a Jesuit university, we ground everything in our mission, and part of our mission identity is the life of St. Ignatius Loyola. So we named our program after the river that he was praying next to when he had his spiritual awakening. Uh, we felt like that was a really great link and a name for a collegiate recovery program. Um, one, this idea of kind of an awakening and a rebirth of understanding, but also just the, the idea of tranquility and a river is just a beautiful image. Um, so our program formally started in uh, 2014. Prior to that, my office has been around um, since around 1992. We've always provided counseling for students in recovery. We've always provided support for them. But this was the first time we developed a formalized program. And thanks to the fine people at TYR, in TYR we, we were able to get some seed money, which was really helpful in gaining that additional layer of institutional support. Um, Currently, the way our program works is we have bi-weekly meetings on campus. So we meet every other week in my office. Part of that's to check in with students, see how they're doing, what their needs are. Um, my role in kind of facilitating the program is one to kind of act as that point person for our students on campus. So if they're having difficulty with classes, just navigating the university system, I'm the person that they contact. Um, so sometimes those come up in that meetings, but it's also just a check and a chance for them to talk with each other. If we have a social event coming up, that's when we're planning it. Um, we do monthly social outings, which I'll get to in a little bit. Those, of course, involve food because our students in recovery, they love to eat. Uh, and currently we have two members. Um, so that's one thing at a private institution, we tend to have a smaller community size. Uh, we've it's been slightly larger. We start with one student. Um, so with two is about two or three is about the average. We do have a drop in space on campus. Um, we, we were trying to find a space for a while and got really creative. We found an empty office. Um, so the office now has a very comfortable chair in there. There's a desk for students that want to do homework. 
Um, it's actually an office in my office suite that my own, that um, student support is housed in, and we're able to give students swipe access to that office. So that way students can access it 24 seven. Um, they don't have access to anything that's confidential or anything like that, but it is a space where they can go do homework, hang out. There's a kitchenette uh, in the larger office suite. Um, so that's available to students. We do have on-campus 12-step meetings. Uh, we have AA, we have NA, and we have Al-Anon. Um, being that we are in Baltimore City, uh, there are a ton of recovery meetings. Uh, there's smart recovery meetings up the road. Um, I don't know if we have a refuge recovery meeting. Baltimore is a very, um, very heavy 12-step area. Uh, so there's over a thousand AA meetings, for example, in Baltimore every week. Uh, what's nice is that we're within five miles of five or six other institutions. So a lot of the recovery meetings off campus tend to have a younger population at them. Um, so I know that's something that our students enjoy is that, you know, when they come to, when they come to Maryland, they come to Baltimore, if they go to meetings, um, you know, they're not always the youngest person in the rooms, which is really nice for them. So on the next slide. Um, so when Kristen first talked to me about this presentation, I kind of thought about what are the, the challenges that I see just working at a private institution. I thought about anytime I've gone to an ARHE conference um, or any other collegiate recovery conference, there's such wonderful programs and ideas out there. And I get back to my hotel room and I'm thinking about, well, this would be great, but it won't work because of this. So I kind of thought through what are those struggles um, or barriers that may exist at a private institution um, that may just look a little different than at a public university. Uh, the first being cost. Um, Loyola is an expensive institution. Um, with room and board, it's over $60,000. Now I will say that the university has allocated a lot of money to financial aid and we try to make Loyola as accessible as possible to all students. Um, but that's a very real concern for our students, whether they went to another institution and are trying to transfer to Loyola, um, or if the student's been through a number of treatment centers and you know, family resources are kind of um, maxed out. Sometimes looking at Loyola's price tag um, can be a deterrent for them, even though we try our best to get them set up with financial aid. The other part is the admissions process. Um, we do have students that transfer to Loyola, but as far as the credits transferring, um, we're, I'm, I can't make the decision that yes, the credits will transfer in depending on the courses. Sometimes it has to go to a department chairman to say, yes, we'll accept those credits from another institution. No, we won't accept those. Uh, and also students were in active use at another institution and they're trying to come uh, and they're trying to come to Loyola. If their grades don't fit the, you know, the university admissions criteria, we don't typically accept students on a provisional basis or anything like that. Um, knowing colleagues at you know public universities, they can have students take a couple classes at community college and get admitted on a provisional basis. That's not something that we really offer here. So again, there's some barriers to our students who may want to come to Loyola for the collegiate recovery program, but just aren't able to because of um, maybe previous history. We try our best to make that work for them, and you know if we can get them into Loyola, we try our best to. But those are some barriers. The other part is the size of the program. Um, and this has shown up in a couple different ways. Uh, the first is very much setting expectations with colleagues on campus. Um, I'll admit that when we first got our TYR grant, I had these grandiose visions of we're going to have you know 20 or 30 students in five years, and three years um, all these great things. Uh, but we are a smaller institution, so our program tends to be smaller. So letting colleagues know that I just can't create 10 or 15 more students in recovery to get the numbers up. Um, so part of that's managing those expectations. But also I talk to prospective students. One of their first questions is, you know, how many students are in your program? Um, and I'm very honest, I'll say, you know, I talked to a student a couple months ago. I say, you know, we have two students right now. And oh, right. the prospective student said, you know, oh, I was really hoping you'd have more. And I said, believe me, I wish that we did too. Um, but right now we have two students. So sometimes that can make it hard for recruitment purposes um, for prospective students wanting a larger collegiate recovery experience. Also just, you know, having two students, if, if one of them doesn't show up to a social outing, that's just the student and the alcohol and drug counselor on campus. I think I'm pretty fun, um, but understandably the dynamic is a little different for the students. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, um, 
So some ways we've addressed those challenges, cost, I wish I could lower the expense of the university, but I'm not able to. Uh, but we do our best to connect students with our financial aid early when they're thinking about coming to Loyola. Um, that tends to be helpful. That way they can begin to have those conversations, really see what kind of financial aid is available and do whatever we can to make it as affordable as possible. Uh, with the admissions process, what we found is the, when, the way we attract students to the program may look a little different than perhaps a, a state institution. Um, knowing of all the you know, people in recovery who may want to pursue um, their degree in higher education, um, we may be just competing for a smaller piece of that pie. Um, the students who may be transferring in from a community college, for example, in Maryland, if you have an associate's degree from a community college, all of your credits automatically transfer to a state university. Being that we're private, we don't have that same arrangement. Um, so we're really looking for us. We love as many people to come as possible, but we know the students coming to us are coming from a few different ways. Um, one, I do a lot of outreach with treatment centers. And it's not necessarily saying, hey, please send students to us. Um, part of it really is in my, my role on campus is we have a student needs to go into treatment. Part of my job is to help place that student in treatment. And by knowing treatment centers, not only am I able to ensure that our students gain a high quality of care, that it's a warm handoff to the new treatment center, uh, but also that treatment center knows me and knows the resources on our campus. It's not uncommon, uh, you know, I've worked at three other institutions where I'll, I'll talk to a colleague at a treatment center who may say, you know, Zach, we have one or two of your students right now. Do you know that? Because we have students who will leave for treatment during winter break or during summer break, what have you. Um, so that way they can, if they have one of our students, they can say, you know, if you want to go back to Loyola, do you know that they have a collegiate recovery program? Do you know who Zach is? So it's helping make sure that if our students leave without the university knowing, um, maybe why they're leaving, that we can retain those students. Also, um, I talk a lot with local IOP providers just because I don't have the ability to provide those services to our students. So sometimes there'll be um, prospective students who they've gone to inpatient treatment somewhere away from home. They've done their IOP here in Baltimore. They may not be from Maryland, but they want to stay close to that recovery support that they've built up. And those IOP providers will say, you know, if you're interested in Loyola, you know, they have a collegiate recovery program. Um, you know, why don't you reach out to Zach? So it's kind of a different way to attract students. It's not the I'm going there with brochures and handing them out to everyone, uh, but just letting them know what the resources are available when I'm looking for resources for our students as well. Uh, also, high school students in recovery, these ten, this tends to be where we get most of our students. Um, students who are already in recovery in high school are, in are coming to Loyola as a typical incoming first year student. And also transfer students from other private institutions. Um, in addition to high school students in recovery, students who perhaps left another institution, took a medical leave, or just withdrew from the institution, but their grades were still intact and they could transfer into Loyola. Those tend to be the two groups of students that we see um end up coming to our program and the big focus uh also in, is focusing on retention so the students that i have who take medical leaves for substance use treatment um, really working with them and their treatment providers say if you want to come back to loyal let's work on what that aftercare plan looks like and try to get them to come back to the university if it's the right fit for them um, so that's kind of how we try to get around the admissions process knowing that it may look a little different to address size, um, I have dubbed this the Philadelphia approach. I'm going to give full credit to my colleagues uh, at St. Joseph University, um, uh, Katie Bean, all the people in Philadelphia. This idea was completely stolen from them. They also have a lovely um, one day conference in August that I encourage anyone can get to it to go to. So the way we kind of use their approach is that we only have two students in our program, but when we do social programs, we partner with Towson University, which is about three miles up the road. And we do this because when our students want to do a social program, we just went to an Orioles game on Friday. Um, you know, while it'd be great for the two students and me to go, it was nice to have six students from Towson, my two students and me there. Um, we found that our students already know each other from going to meetings. So they're already going to meetings together. They have that support. You know, if we're able to facilitate a fun outing for them, why not pull our resources together and make that happen? The other benefit to that too, by being in contact with other universities and doing programs together, especially social programs, there are times where, you know, my students may know a Towson student, 
who d who's not involved with their CRP. And I'll tell my student, well, go ahead and invite your friend at Towson. That way we can connect them with the CRP at Towson and vice versa. So that's another great way where we've been able to um, maybe find, you know, students in recovery that we don't know about. I know it's a challenge for all programs, but sometimes that really works through those social outings together. Um, the other thing is setting realistic expectations. Um, and I, that's more so from my standpoint as an administrator with my colleagues to let them know that, you know, there are some challenges and barriers to working at a private institution and having a CRP. Um, you know, when they Google collegiate recovery programs, all the big ones come up and there's always the questions, well, you know, why aren't we Rutgers or Texas Tech? Um, but saying those expectations of, well, this is what our program looks like. These are the services we provide. And also this is how our students perform. Our, our students are graduating. Um, as much as I'm excited to see them graduate, when you have two students, you, you get a little nervous, um, but that's okay. And, uh, but setting those expectations with colleagues is another huge part. If you, next slide. So looking ahead, um, some things that I'm working on is really under, understanding um, and developing our market. So where we attract students from, and if the, the materials we have, whether that's our website, we do have brochures that our admissions counselors take out on um, college tours, whether those appeal to students that would wanna come to Loyola for our program, as well as our students on the university campus already who may be in recovery, just haven't found our program yet to make sure that we're understanding how to reach out to the students as best as possible. Um, continuing to expand our recruiting channels, I think that's something that being that it's a smaller program, it doesn't necessarily have the name recognition that maybe a larger program does. Um, so having as many, just like there's multiple pathways to recovery, making sure there's multiple pathways um, into our program. We've done a good job with referrals from colleagues and academic advising, uh, really reaching out to graduate students, especially in the psychology program, um, let them know that we have these services available and a lot more collaboration, especially with other colleges, and universities in the area. Uh, like I said, we collaborate heavily with Towson University. Uh, University of Maryland College Park also has a collegiate recovery program. And part of that increased collaboration is just for a long time, Loyal was the only collegiate recovery program in Maryland. So we did have a lot of folks close by to collaborate with. But continuing to do that, um, we found that kind of thinking about it, while each university has their own program, really viewing our recovery community as a regional community for college students, I think it's been a great shift. I think our students have enjoyed that, hearing about what programs are going on at other universities that could happen here. Um, you know, I think that keeps their excitement. Uh, it does make it a little difficult when you're trying to program, you know, three different school schedules with breaks um, and transportation for all the students. Um, but it tends to work out really well and we can pull it together. And funding, that's one thing um, that I know is difficult at all universities, especially at a private institution. Um, they're constantly fundraising or, you know, most private institutions are very heavily dependent on tuition. Um, so looking at where those, those needs are, those demands are for funding and figuring out how we can get some of that funding. Um, it's something we're always looking into, whether that's other grants, um, talking to our uh, development office about when and how we can begin talking to donors to support our program. So those are kind of the constant challenges that I think all programs have, um, but sometimes they're a little more nuanced being at a private institution. And I think that's my last slide. It sure is, Zach. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a, a we have several questions in the chat box, um, okay. but before I open it up to everybody, I just wanted to ask a quick one from TCU. Caroline had a great question. Do you guys have a formal membership criteria at Loyola, like an application process? We don't have a formal application. Um, the only membership criteria is the student has to identify as a person in recovery uh, and they're abstinent from all um, non-prescribed substances. Um, so we don't have any kind of applications, anything like that. The way it works is students will get my name, they'll come to meet with me, I'll talk to them to get a sense for kind of where they are in their recovery journey, um, let them know about the program, see if that's something they're interested in. We do have students who are in recovery that are connected with me through my role on campus, but just choose not to be part of the CRP. Um, but we don't have a formal application process per se. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and I also I wanted to ask Shannon too before we ask um, this this not, this awesome question that Kirk posted here because I think it might be a nice uh, intro into the question. Shannon, you guys have been around for over thirty years. What are some of the the lessons learned as far as um, working with? Uh, and then you identified them as the substance free students students versus the recovery students. We're seeing a lot more of the harm reduction approach. Uh, being um, adopted within collegiate recovery now, and do you guys do you have some experience on that, and kind of what's working and what's not working? So we, um, so th those are two separate things. I mean, the, the combining substance-free students with students in recovery frequently, we're combining students who have never used substances in their lives, which just blows the minds of the kids in recovery that. That there are this many students who don't use substances and who never have, um, and so I think one of the lessons learned, especially in our in our program house, uh, substance free program house, is uh, introducing a, a recovery ally training uh, for the orientation. Um, particularly when we did have a relapse in the house, I think um, uh, there's a lack of understanding on the part of the substance free students about how much shame and stigma that the student felt around that and then the subsequent silence around that because I think people didn't want to talk about it because they said she was uncomfortable and it just sort of perpetuated that. So I think developing an ally training is going to be helpful going forward. Um, our, our experience, my experience with trying to add a single substance or harm reduction just has been disruptive to the group. Um, to, to those in, in abstinence, I know uh, um, having uh, we've had students have to take care of other students in their, when they're trying unsuccessfully to do harm reduction, and it just becomes really disruptive to, to the group. So, um, so we've made a decision not to do that. I do know I have a colleague at PC, uh, Providence College, who does do a combined harm reduction abstinence model. Um, and as well as at URI, and I think both of them might say it probably benefits the harm reduction students more than the abstinence students, or that's their sense. I don't know what the evaluation would show. Um, I would like, to, I, I do, I do think having a harm reduction or single substance abstinent group would be, is needed. I, we just, I think from a people and resources perspective, we're just not, not there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. We had a, at our very first webinar, uh, we had a speaker from College of Charleston, Wood Merchant, who uh, offers a uh, uh, kind of an intervention group for the harm reduction students, invites in the recovery students to be a part of that group if they wish, and have actually turned into some peer mentors, also addressing Kurt's second part of his question. Um, but then those students, the harm reduction students, will enter into the recovery group or crew um, when they're ready. So they're not forced to be in together. Both populations can volunteer to be a part of those um, interactions. Uh, but they do still have separate recovery activities, and then they do have that harm reduction group. So I think that it's going to be an interesting, um, I, it's definitely moving that way. So it's going to be an interesting evolution, I think. So I'm going to open it up now to everybody on the call for just additional comments and questions. Please feel free to just unmute your phones and uh, jump in there if you have anything you'd like to share. Well, th th this is Kirk Luter from Washington and Lee, and I, I'm afraid I don't have a camera on my on my computer. Can you hear me okay? Yes, that's totally okay. fine. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from a small school. We've got about 1,900 undergraduates and 400 uh, law students. So, of course, the big challenge for us is to just maintain a critical mass of, of students to form a coherent uh, group. And, you know, really for that practical reason, I combine uh, students that are in the abstinence-based recovery with students that are, uh, uh, that are just trying to make change with previous high-risk patterns. For us, it's gone well. I, you know, I have not had any experiences with the uh, the control lower risk uh, alcohol students disrupting the group or kind of pulling anybody back. I have seen that the uh, the students that are in more advanced absence based recovery really seem to enjoy the mentor role that they take with the other students who tend to be a little on the on the younger side. Um, 
the biggest problem, the biggest challenge really is that for me is, is trying to form a coherent social group where, you know, the students can really enjoy being together. They're, they're at the place in the weekly support group we have. We usually have eight or 10 students attend on any one week and uh, they really seem to enjoy each other. They tend to hang out a little while after the, after the group and that kind of stuff. We share a meal together and it's a Friday afternoon group that we have, but I don't, think that they get together very much outside of that couple of hours. And, uh, you know, we've developed a few uh, uh, substance-free activities on campus to, to kind of encourage um, uh, students to have a place to just hang out together uh, uh, socially without, uh, without drinking. Uh, we have a, a Friday night coffee house music venue, for example, that, that's been very popular. But my experience has been that the students in, that are, that are um, in recovery are so socially different from the students that have never had problems and that are trying to, that are just sober because that's always what they wanted, uh, you know, that they don't really mix very, uh, very much. So I, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see, you know, have you had other experiences with just trying to, uh, to foster that kind of, of uh, social group that extends beyond a, a support group? Have you developed um, activities that students really enjoy that foster connection, um, you know, whether it's outdoor stuff, uh, road trips like Zach was was talking about to the ball game, that kind of stuff. Any other ideas for, for that? Thanks, Kirk. And anybody have any thoughts on that? I'll just open it up. Shannon or Zach or anybody else? Um, I'll say one thing for our students, and we've talked to them about including just students who decide to be substance free. And my students have been pretty clear that they just don't understand how someone does that. Um, just never uses substances. And we run into that with housing for students that we don't have separate recovery housing. Yeah. And the, the idea of them being in substance free with a student who does understand what recovery means. Um, so when we do programs, uh, as work social programs, like I said, we've been partnering with other universities. Um, but I also sometimes will ask the students, what are you and your friends in um, both students go to AA. So, you know, what do you and your friends in AA like to do? Um, because they may have that recovery social network, just not on campus. Yeah. Um, and if there's a way to kind of pull some ideas from there, or um, a lot of times I'll let our students in recovery know about programs that are taking place on campus that may not necess necessarily be billed as substance free, but I know it's something that they're interested in. Um, so again, kind of integrating them into the larger campus culture, now, obviously, if it's, you know, like an all-you-can-drink event, that's probably not going to make the email going out to the recovery students. Um, but if there's, you know, a big concert on campus or some other large campus celebration, trying to connect them to the, the campus community, that way they don't feel different than everybody else. I hear that a lot, that I'm the only student going through this or we're the only two students and we don't feel like we're part of campus. So sometimes trying to be more purposeful and connecting them to the campus community can be helpful for them. I also think, Kurt, um, we've seen some really great uh, student leadership projects emerge, too, around this topic. So if you have any students that are interested in putting together their own events, and maybe you can help them facilitate that, uh, helping the students in your community feel empowered to do an all-community type event or um, maybe do a leadership training or a retreat. The retreats have, have really produced um, some really great results for a lot of our campuses. I like the idea of a retreat. I hadn't really thought about that. You know, we hit well, our campus is in a small town of 8,000 people in the uh, in the southern Shenandoah Valley. So there's not a whole lot going on in town outside of the outside of the campus. I mean, there, you know, the students certainly go to things that are on that are on campus. But it's the kind of thing that I'm really looking for isn't entertainment. It's ways for them to hang out together for long periods of time to just foster foster friendship and mutual support. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the retreat would be great. I started a collegiate recovery program in rural Georgia that had about 20,000 people that lived in it. And that's what we would do, uh, like weekend getaways to the mountains or go, you know, float down the river somewhere. Just having two or three days where that small group of students could really bond together helped um, sort of kind of get everybody to gel a little bit better. Yeah, I love that. I love that idea. Who else would like to share in the conversation today? Well, I'll, we've, uh, the student activity club has done, likes to do laser tag and rock climbing. I think those are also events that, that people sort of connect with, uh, um, 
over. Um, and you know, when, when the when the student who started the SOBEAR, the Substance Free Student Activity Group, he thought he would get maybe 10 students and he got over 200 students sign up at the Student Activities Fair. And, and I think the students in recovery will say the Substance Free Students don't get it, but they don't need to get it to go rock climbing. <laughs> you know, they just need to, to have a group um, that wants to do something on a Friday night and not be on campus. And I think particularly for students who are coming in recovery that they entered into high school, they do, they want to be part of the social fabric of campus. And I think yeah. that in yeah. this age of diversity and inclusion, I've really hammered home this idea with my colleagues that we have to maintain the integrity of our substance-free spaces for all students because it's an educational access issue. And I think that when they feel I'm united- sorry, could, could you say that again, Shannon? You've, sure. I've been a pretty strong advocate for maintaining the integrity of our substance-free spaces. I don't know if this is for your substance-free housing or events that are supposed to be substance-free, but often they are not, or yeah. the enforcement is, is poorly maintained. And, and I've been really vocal that that is an educational access issue. It's a diversity yeah, yeah. and inclusion issue, and our students have a right to educate, you know, access their education. Um, and it's also been a really good message, a non-enforcement message to their substance using peers. It's not about trying to enforce policy about around your substance use. It's about the preventing students who need to be substance free from the ability to have a comfortable and safe living environment. Yeah, but I have never had that thought before uh, to kind of really see this as an equal access uh, issue. And I, you know, I don't know how it was that I've been doing this for several years and never, never really thought of it. But uh, I, that seems like a really important uh, angle on this. Yeah. 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 That's a yeah. great point. B, did you want to jump in there? Beatrice, it doesn't sound like your microphone is, is, is working. Yeah, B, we don't, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. We can see you though. You look gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> we can't see Kurt, but we can hear him. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, while B is working on her sound, I think that that is a really important piece of this. The other piece I think that Zach and Shannon and all of us have really touched on today is the importance of kind of weaving in the mission of a collegiate recovery program or community with the university's mission. Um, and I think that Brown has really expressed, you know, that they're, they're very um, uh, pro-student. Uh, Loyola was very pro-whole student in their mission. And both programs have figured out a way to kind of weave into that um, system. Did we get you back, B? No, nope. okay. While she's working on her microphone, this is Caroline from TCU. Hey, Caroline. Y'all should be able to but not see me. Um, this is sort of related, but just kind of more specific on like activities and things that have worked for us in like building off of things that our university already offers to our students, um, just kind of tailoring them towards our students in recovery is um, we partner a lot with our recreation center and our outdoor program um, where they I mean, they plan all the, the events for us of hiking or rock climbing, stand-up paddleboard yoga, whatever it might be. Um, you know, we offer that for our students in recovery as well as um, we've got a database of, of students who have given us uh, permission to notify them about events that don't center around alcohol. So that could be like these out, outdoor programs um, or also like concerts on campus or events that are going on that just simply don't don't center on alcohol um, or other substances. So we invite both the students from our recovery program as well as the students on that list, um, like the substance-free students, and they kind of mingle with each other that way. Um, we don't do any specific programs where it's it's like just those two groups. Um, we just kind of advertise and promote those events to those students because they've you know opted in to say, hey, I want to know more about this. Um, so that's been really successful for us, and we're lucky to have um, really almost weekly uh, substance-free events on campus that's paid for through our student activities office. Um, some pretty, 
I wouldn't say A list, but B, C list, uh, musical artists and comedians and stuff like that. Um, where, you know, students that are looking for something to do on the weekend, um, this is a great opportunity and they've been gracious enough to have front row seating or a couple of VIP meet and greets where we can let students know, you know, hey, first five people that respond to this email get a meet and greet for this Friday. Um, so that's been a, a great way to kind of entice them to to join in and have fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, this all kind of feeds back into that student recruitment piece too, right? Um, some of the barriers that were that we talked about, some of the challenges, maybe not barriers, but just challenges that private universities, especially those of you guys that have really strict admissions policies, um, that student recruitment piece is going to be really challenging. And so how do you build a community and make it look fun and recovery cool and, and make students want to get involved if you only have like two students is what Zach was saying. So. Um, so opening up, I can see the connection to the substance-free students as well, just to help kind of build this community. Uh, but there's need to be some education in there too, right? So that ally training, that kind of sense of understanding that needs to be built. Um, and then as a person in long-term recovery who got sober uh, pretty young, I was 21, I'll have to say I had to relearn how to be social. I had to be awkward. I had, it was almost like going to a middle school dance sometimes when I was on campus. It was you know, everybody else was on one side of the campus and it was me all by myself trying to relearn how to be a young person. Um, so I think that any kind of um, activities that we can as program facilitators cultivate that makes that awkwardness a little less um, intimidating for recovery students can be very helpful. Christian, if you don't mind me asking a, a follow-up question about that, mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, complaints that students in my group have is that if they're staying completely sober, they feel like they're shut off from romantic or sexual opportunities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, most of my group, most of the group that's, that that, that uh, is running here is male, and they, they have a sense that it's completely unacceptable for them to flirt with women who have been drinking at all. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> who wants to take that one? Let's see. <laughs> well, I will say from my personal experience, I will just say quickly that dating in recovery as a young person uh, was very tricky for me early on. And yeah. then having worked in collegiate recovery, navigating those particular situations with the students requires um, some tact and being very careful, but also building that really strong peer community so that they can rely on each other for some feedback too, because they're going to rely on their peers more for that kind of stuff. Right. So I think doing, um, you know, some seminars or some group discussions or, you know, trying to help them work up the courage to just try it, try a relationship, try dating um, in a safe way can be very helpful. Yeah. And just to go off that, I I've had those conversations with our, our male students, um, and I think part of it is kind of reinforcing some of those, those campus messages around what consent looks like, um, you know, personal boundaries, and also boundaries for them. Um, you know, if they're choosing to enter into a romantic relationship with someone who's not in recovery, um, how's that going to be for them? Um, you know, kind of navigating those situations, because I do hear that from students that they, they still want the full college experience, um, but they want to do it in recovery if that means romantic relationships. So really processing through with them what that looks like, what a healthy relationship looks like, um, and even giving them resources of, you know, if they're really concerned if it's a male student, you know, can I talk to a female student who's been drinking and, you know, they want some really concrete answers. I always refer them to our sexual violence prevention coordinator, who's wonderful at talking to students in recovery and can really kind of explain through with them, you know, what are some healthy ways to go about, you know, starting relationships? Because we know the, the hookup culture is so prevalent on college campuses, and that's going to look very different if you're a student in recovery. Um, you know, because again, you don't want to be accused of anything that would be, you know, sexual violence or being labeled as, you know, um, kind of a, a, a sketchy guy because you're sober talking to someone who's been drinking. Yeah, thank you. I, I think I'm just going to make a note here that may be one of our topics for the next webinar series in the fall, uh, relationships and recovery. 
Um, it looks like we have another question from Sarah in the chat box. Um, Shannon uh, or Zach, are you guys familiar with any of that uh, equality literature that we were kind of talking about here about equal access to education? Is there anything that that we could put together to to send out to people with their for their uh, conversations with senior administration? I don't know of any. Uh, literature and details of the writer, but um, it, but it would it just I think when you explain not just students in recovery but students who are coming from a family with a history of addiction or trauma around substance or alcohol use, it really starts to make sense when we were required to provide a safe environment for them. And so, just how we think about a safe environment, safe of racial or sexual harassment or, or, or um, violence, I think thinking about substances in that way um, also starts to make sense. But no no literature that I'm aware of. But I feel like, who 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 is the current president, Archie president? Is it? Amy from Vermont, Amy Boyd Austin. Amy, Amy, yeah, she did a really nice, her very first letter uh, in re maybe recovery campus as president really address this as a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. And I've just taken it uh, to expand it to all substance-free students because one of the students that really struggled being in a substance-free hall without a substance-free roommate was not that when her roommate would come home drunk, but it was the not knowing, is it gonna to be tonight that she's gonna come home drunk? Mm -hmm. And for a student who has prior family trauma around a, a parent who is an alcoholic, that was an untenable situation to live in. And um, and so when I think about advocacy around the right that, that substance-free students have to that, I think about like, particular students and I can think about and tell their stories, so. Thank you, that's a great point. Um, one thing that we do is we make sure our students in recovery are connected with our disability support service office because students in recovery are covered on the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so that's always an important thing to let our students know. Part of it is they would have to disclose the recovery status to the university, but it does help with substance-free housing and helping them get parking passes on campus. Um, the other thing that we've added ours into is the uh, biannual review for the Drug-Free Schools and Communities Act um, as part of the uh, return to campus and support section of that document. And it was a couple years ago, and I, I wanna say it was the ARHE conference in Atlanta, um, Beth DeRico, and I'm blanking on the other presenter's name, did a really great presentation on how to connect your CRP to your biannual review. Um, so kind of tied to that federal law that's required. Um, so if there's a way to find that presentation, um, that'd be a good one. I'm, I'm not, I don't think I have a copy of it, um, but that may be a way to kind of connect it for your senior administration of, you know, this is a report we have to do every other year you know, this is why we should include our CRP in that. Thank you, Zach. That's really important to, to mention that biannual review. I appreciate that. Um, it looks like B has, we're gonna, we'll do one more question and that's from Beatrix that we could never get um, on the phone. I'm so sorry. I have a question for Zach. She says, I've had a hard time obtaining a dedicated room. You said you found an empty office. Did your institution give you a hard time with getting that office? I did not have a hard time um, because we had been storing extra office supplies in that office. And because I cleaned it out, <laughs> I think that's what helped me get it. Um, but it, it's with the understanding that if there's a need for that office, that we will lose it. Um, but saying that, you know, this is a drop in space for our students, we also call it a, uh, a relaxation room for any student, but it's housed in my office suite. So basically, our recovery students have kind of squatted there and made it their own. Thank you. I appreciate that. To any links, right? To any links. For our right. <laughs> well, thank you for the discussion, you guys. I just want to quickly remind you that next week, actually on May 2nd, we have a fantastic conversation with some people in North Carolina who've done some really cool things. Um, speaking of advocacy for our students, we can also advocate outside of the higher education walls and get to the state level. And we've seen some really cool stuff happening in states like North Carolina and Texas and New Jersey, for example, when this happens. So please feel free to register if you haven't already, if you're new to this uh, webinar series. 
Um, pretty much everybody in here already has, so you should get the email anyway. Um, and then also the ninth uh, National Collegiate Recovery Conference and 17th Recovery High School Conference is in Houston. Um, so please uh, feel free to reach out if you have questions about that. But you can use grant money for travel and for registration if you're having trouble getting your university to help cover it. So I just want to thank you all so much for joining us again. Uh, the link will be sent out to this presentation along with an evaluation. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just filling that out and giving us feedback, we really appreciate it. I hope you all have a wonderful day. And again, thank you to our amazing presenters, Zach and Shannon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.